sorry if uh, if I I'm not there, uh, and despite uh, the I'm not uh, far away, but uh, I also have some uh, some problems, uh, and so I couldn't come. Okay, so I want to um, talk to you about uh, these uh, um, recent developments that we've done on the some machine learning accelerating them DFT sampling and in particular conformance samplings of these catalytic processes. So we are interested in catalysis and we have studied a number of reactions and in particular um, In particular, uh, recently we have studied the, these uh, reforming reactions, so hydrogen production, which are uh, like steam reforming, aqueous phase reforming, which in which you have some biomass. I mean, uh, typically in our uh, models, uh, it's a simplified uh, uh, methanol species, and you want to transform it, uh, react for, for example, in this case, in aqueous phase reforming with water, and produce CO2 and H2, and then you can capture the CO2, and this is called the process uh, blue hydrogen, which uh, occurs as uh, according to um, several uh, respective studies, uh, as, uh, uh, it will be more and more important in the future. So we want to study this. Okay, catalysis, as uh, Anastasia mentioned, is clearly an inter uh, heterogeneous catalysis and it's an interfacial process. So you have some starting species and you have an interface between a metal, for example, and an adsorbent. And the starting species in this process, you have this chemical transformation with bone breaking and uh, forming. And you go from methanol to radicals uh, and so on uh, until you transform it to CO2 NH2 or other uh, processes. Catalysis is also an activated process. So you start from reactants, you go through a saddle point, and you go to products. So there is an energy difference between reactor and products, but the difficulty and what the catalyst is doing is trying to uh, reduce this energy point. So reduce the energy of the saddle point. So basically you have the problem. One is the sampling, the sampling problems, which is, uh, um, as also uh, Anastasia mentioned, you have to sample this uh, uh, local minima which are the local basins uh, attracting uh, the, in which the species mostly resides. And then you have a sampling of the barriers, also of the saddle points that you have uh, to go through to transform your uh, chemical species. So this dynamics of activities processes is a long standing uh, problem in uh, in uh, since uh, many years, and uh, um, we have de developed a, a, a set of tools to deal with this process. And uh, there are these tools which are uh, global optimization tools to search for this uh, uh, local minima. And then we have other path sampling tools for searching for saddle point. I will not talk about that, but I will focus on every, all the sampling that you have to do, you, you can do at different levels. And what we are talking about today is how to accelerate this sampling using complementary tools like uh, machine learning, the interpolation of the potential and surface. So I will not talk about this, but we do have these global optimization tools. We have this path sampling. Uh, codes and approaches, and then we are putting everything together combined with the machine learning. So if we use machine learning, this work simply to fit a neural network potential. So to have an interpolation of the potential in the surface calculated at a higher level like DFT, and we want a fast calculation of energy and forces. And machine learning provides a, a usually a regular, accurate, and robust interpolation of potential in the surface. So in particular, we have used two uh, machine learning force fields, which is the Parinello, one of the two first ones proposed, and the latest one. So 
what is the problem with this machine learning interpolation? First one is the complexity. So the complexity in the sense that if you count the number of parameters that you introduce in this uh, force field in this interpolation and that, that make them accurate, then it's about a thousand degrees of freedom, a thousand parameters. So you need a correspondingly large number of information to fit uh, reasonably these parameters. And so you need basically, this is a problem of complexity, so you need many uh, uh, points to interpolate. But the problem is that how to reduce as much as possible the number of information that you put into the machine learning interpolation. And the second is the accuracy. So uh, typically in most uh, uh, machine learning force field, uh, we, you see it has been proposed or been developed, the, the accuracy, the maximum accuracy is like 0.05 electron volt per atom on the energy, for example. But this for a system with 50, 60 atoms only means uh, an accuracy on the total energy of about 0.3 EV, which is of, which is usually not sufficient to give you a uh, something interesting from the point of view of uh, operative use of actual uh, interpolation and uh, use uh, to to make predictions so we want to reduce the absolute or increase the absolute accuracy to down to less than 0 0.1 EV to make to make this uh, uh, useful and uh, working so as I said, that we have all these codes, all these methods that I mentioned, global optimization, reactive global metadynamics, uh, NEB, path sample, and so on. We have a code which basically can, inter can use all these approaches. And uh, now we're uh, using this. How can we use these approaches and try to use machine learning to accelerate the sampling? Okay, there are two methods, and the first one is more traditional. The second one is the one that I'm going to talk about, which is conformal sampling. Okay, so what do you want to do? You want to accelerate the DFT modeling, in particular the sampling, to do the sampling systematically at the neural network level. So you don't want to uh, use a high level and uh, computational demanding approach to do the sampling. You want the high level to give you the information that you need to interpolate a machine learning force field and then use this machine learning force field as much as possible to, um, to do the sampling and then double check with uh, the higher level approach. And this double check is called active learning. So you, uh, you produce via the sampling using the neural network potential, you produce configurations and then you check whether your configurations are within or outside the confidence range of the of your uh, neural network potential. And then, if they are outside, you include them in an, uh, in an a larger database to produce an incrementally more and more accurate neural network potential. And then you check only the important steps. Okay, this is working, but the two problems is the, the, the slowness of this approach and then the accuracy. So you, again, you can sample, for example, with molecular dynamics, this bottom of the potential energy surface, and then you use, uh, uh, you parameterize the force field, increasing the accurate, and then you use uh, some other method, like, for example, metadynamics to force the system out of these uh, uh, local minima, and then you get new configurations with the force field, and you check whether these are within or outside the confidence range, and so on and so forth, and then you do this systematically. But for example, to do this uh, uh, in a specific process, you take at least uh, 15, 20 iterations to get uh, a potential which is able to describe you uh, this process of transformation from this local minima to this other local minima, so the reactive process. And the accuracy, the final accuracy is not uh, uh, sufficient. So what else can we do? Okay, let's think about uh, something uh, more, let's say, uh, more into extracting and exploiting the previous knowledge 
that you already have on some system to try to extrapolate this knowledge and bring it to enlighten another system. So the idea is to start from a worked out case to ex exploit the previous knowledge as much as, as possible in terms of what? Not in terms of the potential, because the potential would be different when you go from one system to another, but in terms of configurational database. And you try to um, translate the configurational database that you have from one system by conformality to another system. And you need to generate information, as we have seen, on the local basing and also the funnels, the barrier funnels, but not just the exact mechanism of transformation, but something which is all around these uh, uh, configurations uh, that go uh, through a minima, through a saddle point and so on, to a bit more to give enough information to fit another um, machine learning force feed for this different new and unknown system. And then, of course, you do also active learning. So you, uh, when you have this uh, database uh, and this uh, neural network potential, you use it to generate the reactions, and then you see whether the generated reactions have configuration which are within or outside, and if they're outside the confidence range, you include them and so on. Okay, so this is the approach, and the application that we used it is um, this hydrogen production, in particular aqueous phase reforming, and in particular the methanol uh, decomposition. So the methanol decomposition on a specific system, which is, um, so we studied, you had conducted the FT study on this specific system, so on platinum as a catalyst, on two facets, actually we have three, but for this uh, um, conformal uh, method uh, test, uh, we have used only two. Uh, and uh, we studied this platinum 100 and platinum uh, 111 surfaces as catalysts for this uh, APR on uh, uh, of methanol, so hydrogen production of starting from methanol, and then um, this is the starting point. So the worked out case. Okay, there is a technical uh, um, point which is the high coverage of the surface, so the process does not work at low coverage or high coverage of hydrogen and so on, but um, let's uh, uh, skip these technical details and say that we have a worked out case. We have all the configurations, local minima, and also uh, barrier configurations. And then we have a um, energy, so the energy is associated with all of them. Okay, let's take this configurational database. And then with this configuration database, we generate a first generation neural net of potential. Then we do the barrier calculation. We extract this uh, selected structure, which are not uh, confident, on which we are not confident. We augment the database and we do a bit of active learning. The uh, critical point that allows you to go uh, to, as we will see, to a good accuracy is how you generate the database. So how you translate the conformational database into the new one. And we do this via, via coordinate rescaling. And, uh, and basically, this is an example. So we take, uh, for example, for this process, for the different reactions of so this um, seven reactions, so we take the seven steps from the original uh, system worked out case, and then these are the configuration that we put initially in the, the uh, configuration database and on which we calculate the FT single point energies for the new system, not for the platinum, but for another system. In this specific case, it's nickel 100, but uh, uh, you can do also, we've done also for other systems in particular, to test the approach, we used this set of eight <clears throat> metals, including platinum, because we have redone platinum, not at the high coverage or low coverage. So in, in principle, also platinum is a test. And then we have done these eight systems. So 100 and 111 facet of these eight systems, so 16 cases. 
And then, well, let's go directly to the results. This is, for example, silver. Okay, silver has, with respect to platinum, has a different lattice parameter um, and a rather different uh, chemical behavior. Uh, so we chose this eight also because, okay, palladium may be similar to platinum, although the lattice parameter is different, but I mean, we have gold, silver, copper, which are very different, but also the first row transition methods are rather different, have different uh, affinity for hydrogen, for carbon, for oxygen, and so on. So we thought this is a good case. And these are the results. So we have three steps, for example, and these are the barrier that we predict with the neural network potential after one step of a field learning, and then the second step of a learn. And this is, these are the barriers that we have redone for this system to, as a test to see whether we are accurate or not uh, using the FT. So without using the machine learning acceleration as an independent test. And you see that for all this system, even though the barriers are pretty high, we have two EV. Okay, clearly silver 100 is not a good catalyst for this system. This is not a point. So we're not searching for the good catalyst at this point. We're simply testing the method, the approach. You see that despite the barriers are high, the accuracy that we get after two steps of active learning is basically 0.06 EV in terms of absolute accuracy. So we have achieved uh, the um, the accuracy that we want. And then we've done this for copper, we've done this for nickel 110 and so on. Uh, and these are the uh, energy, free energy profiles that we get from this approach. Okay, so what are the conclusions? Okay, so as in many approaches, we've done sampling statistics systematically at the neural network potential level and this is corresponds to accelerating as much as possible the sampling using a, a lower level um, theory, but in this case also accurate. Second, we exploit the previous knowledge from a worked out case, which works in this specific case, but in general, it could be general. I mean, we could use for any other system, any other process. And so this uh, um, conformality uh, use of the previous knowledge accelerate a lot the uh, prediction and allows you, uh, given the fast convergence of elective learning and the good accuracy that we get, allows you to transfer knowledge from one system to a different one. So it allows you to change the catalyst. So um, to explore now not only the uh, eight system that we've done, but also in principle uh, alloy system, multi-element alloys, anything. And so it gives you a tool to make a really uh, complete search in the space of the catalyst, assuming only that you keep the same mechanism as in the worked out case. To exploit this completely, when we need uh, a couple more um, development. And the first one is to combine this conformal approach with uh, the sampling of the uh, compositional space so of the elements. And um, we have tools to do that. So the global optimization tools that uh, I mentioned at the beginning we do have a tool which is very effective, very efficient in this way. And actually, just to give you an idea, we have recently studied with a simple, a simpler uh, force field. We, have, we have studied, uh, for example, silver copper particles with containing 400 atoms. And uh, we started from completely random distribution of silver and copper and 400. And what we get, is this uh, hybrid uh, motifs, so particles in which, which are much lower than any particle, I mean, uh, I know for this system, which um, comparing with the other uh, our global optimization approaches, which are hybrid, so which have 
a uh, hycosahedral part and a Leary part, so an FCC reconstructed part. So um, we managed uh, to uh, to find or to predict something which, uh, as far as I know, is the only way that gives you this hybrid in a, um, an efficient way, this hybrid motifs for this uh, complicated uh, system. Another approach that we need to uh, eventually uh, use is not only to do this global optimization, but also to do high throughput. And uh, we do have a tool also for this. And this uh, high throughput is uh, an approach that uh, we have uh, proposed a few years ago with Bill and which uh, consists in analyzing the free energy diagram, uh, singling out the main barriers and the type of the barriers that you have, and then trying to um, do the high throughput, taking into account and exploiting this uh, free energy diagram information. And then you can do this uh, sifting of, uh, uh, in this case, uh, possible dopants uh, using the different barriers in an efficient way to get to the possible candidates. Okay, so um, I finished with uh, my presentation. I wanted to mention the people that have contributed to this work. And so these are the people in Pisa uh, that have contributed that uh, they work on uh, high throughput as they, we've done with Bill. And then uh, they work with uh, on uh, sampling and machine learning potentials as been done with the Cambridge people, David Waits and Gabor Sun. Support uh, funding is from the, uh, the uh, National Center for HPC in Italy, and I want to thank you for your attention. <clears throat> that was very nice, Alessandro. Um, so I think so. So you you use machine learning for cases where you already knew a mechanism for a related system, and then you found uh, only maybe a a few thousand comparisons to quantum mechanics allowed you to extend it to new to new catalysts, new systems with the same mechanism. I think that I think that's plausible that that can work. Of course, there are some systems where maybe the mechanism will change uh, when you change the catalyst, um, and that can make it considerably more complicated. But um, but it's good progress. I think in a lot of important reactions like oxygen evolution reaction, CO2 reduction, it's better enough have initial first principle studies to maybe have some idea about the mechanisms. So maybe in those cases, only a few thousand comparisons with quantum mechanics might be adequate. Um, yeah. Did um, we have some comments from the audience here? If I can uh, add something to your uh, comment, Bill, um, I would say that yes, you're right. I mean, if the mechanisms change, um, the, the, of course, uh, it becomes more complicated. I just simply wanted to mention that in some of the cases, I've not shown, but in some of the cases, there's a change in absorption sites because uh, the, when you change the, the, the surface, when you go from platinum to uh, nickel, iron, and so on, then you can change the absorption sites. Well, the uh, two steps of active learning in this case are sufficient to deal with this, uh, let's say, limited change in the mechanics. Yeah, of course, you have to do the quantum mechanics on those new sites also. Yes, but you include basically the, the potential will give you, uh, in the, uh, at least in these cases, that uh, you change an absorption site. And so it will give you a configuration, initial configuration that with the two steps of a T learning, you manage to interpolate accurately. So it, 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 I haven't shown it, but we have a case in which uh, um, this happens and still we get a good accuracy in the final prediction after the two steps of a till learning. Sounds good. So do we have some more discussion from the audience? Towards the end, uh, you were mentioning uh, sort of a nanoparticle structure with like 400 whatever. Uh, I was wondering what what is uh, stabilizing that heterogeneity? Yeah, um, basically it's uh, a frustration. So you have in a size range, 
in which uh, you're crossing from some inside the range and composition range in which you're crossing from the icosahedral or polyicosahedral motif in which you have this copper core and surrounded by silver and then to a motif in which you have to um, a, a range of um, sizes and composition in which actually the FCC, so the bulk uh, structure is favored. And so the, 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 the particle is trying to compromise these two and come up, comes up with a hybrid structure which is compatible. So if you look at the interface between the two pieces, uh, uh, it makes sense. So it's energetically favorable. So this is what, uh, um, uh, what uh, makes to me interesting. So the fact that you can create this hybrid structure at the crossing between different size regime and different composition regime. Some more discussion from the audience here. Good. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, so maybe a naive question, but it's like, so at the end you mentioned that so you train your model, so your neural network, your neural network on like metal, and then you can use for like alloy. Uh, alloy. Is yes. it like you start to like kind of extrapolate? And I thought like, or in my case, most of the time when you start to extrapolate, like the neural network start to be totally off. Uh, can you comment on that? And the, uh, I haven't uh, catched the last word. So the neural network starts to. Uh, when like you, you train your neural network, you train your neural, neural network on like uh, metal, and then you do some prediction on like alloy. This is what yes. you maybe I misunderstood. Uh, and I thought like, well, in my case, uh, most of the time when you try to extrapolate, the model is totally off. Yeah. So um, well, um, let's put it this way: we have gone, we have gone from platinum to copper and for platinum to palladium. So we are extrapolating or bringing new information from one system, which is platinum, to very different system like copper and palladium. What we are now doing is to extrapolating from platinum to copper palladium alloy. So uh, to me, if I can extrapolate from platinum to copper, which is quite distance, or to silver, as I've shown with the data, and we can extrapolate for uh, platinum to palladium, which is closer, then why not both of them? So when, when you have both of them in, uh, in the same uh, slab or in the same particle, uh, there is a danger of extrapolation, but uh, I mean, since we have done uh, we have extrapolated already to something far like uh, copper or uh, silver from platinum, I think you should be able uh, to extrapolate it to also alloys. And then, anyway, this is what we're doing right now. All right. <clears throat> Any other uh, comments or questions from the audience? Anyone from the virtual audience, just yell out. Okay, thank you very much, Alessandro. Thank you, Bill. Stimulating talk, including machine learning.